Hello, contractors. This is the Profit Toolbelt Podcast. My name is Dominic Rubino, and today's guest is going to be Joanna Cooper, and she's the GM for the North Carolina location of Daimler Truck. Yeah, we got her. Here's why this episode is important, because I want to show you how big companies buy, how they look at bids, how they look at tenders, and what you need to know if you do commercial work and you want to work with a big company like hers. She's going to share three important factors that go into their decision to work with a contractor like you. So if you do commercial work and you want to have a solid, reliable, gold star, blue chip customer, this is going to give you the kind of insight your competitors aren't even thinking about. And let me add this. If you want to one day sell your contracting business, the new buyer is going to ask you to tell them about the kind of clients you've done work for. Wouldn't you love to be able to rattle off a list of names as big and powerful as Daimler Truck or whatever's big in your area? That would make them very excited and that would get you a premium for your business. Now, Joanna's got a wealth of knowledge in operations and leadership. And look, if you're a residential contractor and you're thinking, oh, this might be interesting, hang on. I'll bet you see the similarities between commercial and residential work and how it all still comes down to building solid relationships. All right. If you're new to this podcast, let me tell you what this podcast is all about. If you tuned in, it's because you're at the point in your business where you realize it's time to level up and you're in the right place. You know, this show is built to hit three high points. We're here to educate, inform, and inspire business owners like yourself, contractors. Joanna today is going to educate and inform you. The inspiration is going to have to come from you. My goal is to show you the path so you can move from being a contractor who has a shop or a field crew and change your thinking, your approach, your mindset to one where you're a business person who just happens to run a construction company. Now think about your operations right now. And it doesn't matter if you do a million a year, 10 million a year, whatever it is, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job at being a million dollar business or a $10 million business. The zeros don't matter. But if that's not what you want anymore, if you've decided that now you want to be a two, three, four million dollar business, something has to change in your business and your operations and your mindset and your people and your process and your systems for you to get there. Well, it turns out that is the outline for the podcast schedule this year. On this show, you're going to hear from other experts in the field. You're going to be surprised by some of the outside guests like Joanna. Guests I bring in so you have perspective. The problem is for too long, our industry has been keeping secrets and sort of just walking around in circles and I'm done with it. It doesn't need to be that way. There are simple systems to help you run this business, make the money you deserve, and really at the end of the day, live the life you want to live. Those simple systems, those are going to give you the quiet confidence to take this company wherever you want to get to. Now, all of that is a lot of mindset, a lot of positioning. Then why would I do that? And how would I help you get the right mindset for business? Well, I've got a couple of dad jokes for you. Why dad jokes? Why bad jokes? Why dad jokes poorly delivered with poor timing? Because I want to get you laughing. I want to get your mind open to hear what Joanna has to say. Now, she's the GM of Daimler Truck. She came from engine, chassis, and, and axle assembly. She's from that industry. So I decided I was going to get you some dad jokes and funny things from the truck industry. So here's a couple things to keep in mind. <clears throat> here's one. Maybe this should this one should be a bumper bumper sticker. Get a new truck for your spouse. It'll be a great trade. My truck has the best security system in the world. I can leave it parked and unlocked with the keys in the ignition and nobody steals it. And sometimes I wish someone would. You know, these days electric cars are everywhere and with the rise of self-driving vehicles, it's only a matter of time before we get a country song where a guy's truck leaves him too. That one's coming soon. I wonder if somebody's already done it. Um, hey, here's one. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Have you ever tried eating egg yolk off your truck's wheels? I highly recommend it. After all, there's no plate like chrome for the hollandaise. Oh, that one's a groaner for sure. Um, here's, a, here's a mental twister for you. I tried to get a shipment of fire hydrants from the factory that makes them but I wasn't allowed to stop anywhere near the place. Okay, let me wind it up here. You ready? This one's a little bit longer, but it's certainly one you can tell. You can tell this when you're on the job site if you want to break the ice at a toolbox talk or something like that. 
There's a guy driving down the road behind an 18 wheeler. And at every stoplight, the trucker would hop out of the, the cab. He'd run on, run to the back and bang on the trailer door. Well, after seeing this at a whole bunch of intersections in a row, the, the guy following him pulled into the parking lot behind him. And when they both came to a stop, the truck driver uh, jumped out and started banging on the trailer door again. And so the, the, this other driver goes up to him and says, hey, look, at, I don't mean to be nosy. Why do you keep banging on that door? And the trucker replied, sorry, I, I can't talk right now. I have 20 tons of canaries and a 10 ton limit. So I have to keep half of them flying at all times. I <laughs> uh, hope you weren't drinking uh, coffee at that point. Look, get back to seriousness. <clears throat> I host this podcast because one day I want to be your business coach. I'm just going to put it out there. As a matter of fact, I have a team of business coaches that I've personally hand selected. And I have very high expectations for the people that join my team. And I am proud of every single one of them. As you listen to this podcast, ask yourself if you think me and my team might be the right tool to help you get to the next level. Now, with that being said, let me go into business coach mode right now. I'm going to challenge you because in this episode with Joanna and myself, you're going to hear something or learn something or realize something. It might be something you used to do that you've got to bring back forward. It might be something you've never done that you want to try. It might be something other people are doing that you've been curious about. I don't know what it's going to be, but you will. But on that action item. I want you to do something in the next 24 hours. And then what I want you to do is pay attention to how that improves your business or your life. That's it. One small ask. I'll ask you this other thing. It's a thought starter. Are you happy being a contractor who runs a few crews or are you ready to be a business person who just happens to run a construction company? By the end of today's episode, you'll know the answer. Let's get to it. Joanna Cooper, how are you? I am doing great. Yeah. So great to talk to you today. I know. And great to talk to you as well. You're very, you're very jet setty. Last time I talked to you, I think you had just flown in from somewhere where you were speaking and uh, where are you not flying today? Are you? No, not flying today. Yeah. Next Friday, but not today. <laughs> uh, is it fun or work on a Friday? Uh, family. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Yep. Next Friday, I get to go see my family. Yeah. Uh, and it, where in the country are they? What state? Uh, in Detroit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because yep. you're in North Carolina right now, right? Yep. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. Love it. Oh, so beautiful there. It is. It yeah. doesn't get too cold in the wintertime. I have not seen a snowflake this year and nor do I want to. So it's been great. But you're flying to Detroit. Family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was going to say, but there's snow there. Yeah. The things you do for family. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. Anything for family. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I haven't been this nervous in a long time having a guest like yourself. This is pretty interesting to me and to our audience. No, you and I, I'm just a simple girl. Uh, that's how it all starts. And when I hear that, I'm like, uh Oh, locked and loaded for, for, for trouble or mental, um, a mental challenge. You and I are going to talk about how big companies buy, and you are very well suited for that conversation because you are the general manager of Daimler Truck North America. Yep. At the Mount Holly truck plant. At the Mount Holly truck plant. I love it. Yeah. So <clears throat> can I ask you a question here? It's going to sound very abrupt, Joanna. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. I, I sense you're a pretty direct person. So here it comes. Absolutely. Who the heck are you? And how is it you come to be speaking to all these forward-facing trade contractors all over the world? Well, Dom, I am really simply just a De Detroit girl mm -hmm. that has found a home in the manufacturing world. Mm -hmm. I have been working for Daimler Truck now for 16 years and actually started my career on the purchasing side. So I got to do a lot of buying when it came to product components and things like that. Right. Um, over the course of my career, I transitioned to doing some program project management with equipment installations and new launches and things like that. And with that, I shifted over to the manufacturing side and really found my groove. It yeah. was a good blend of chaos and curiosity. And um, in that, in running a plant, it's not just the production and the manufacturing piece. It's also right what it takes to run a facility, right, yeah. and and keep it moving and keep water from coming in <laughs> on, on our employees and and things like that. And so, 
when we had the pre-discussion and we were talking about is it a fit or not, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's really, you know, that all-encompassing um, responsibility of right running a large facility. Yeah. And it's on the facility. So some people listening might be thinking, why do we have the general manager for Daimler at Mount Holly on here? But it's because of the facilities side and the background and purchasing and like you're really looking, you're you're like the mini president of this division. You have to look after all those things and you're a buyer of a lot of our listeners' services. Yeah, because you know when you run in a manufacturing facility, you know, it's in the building and there are safety protocols, you know, there are environmental concerns, there are just general upkeep because for longevity and and making sure that the integrity of the building is is up to snuff. Yeah. Yeah, you and I were joking about roll up doors, and then you you made a comment about how often those things get bent or hit. <laughs> they they can get hit often, especially when you have high lows and things like that that are running through your facility. Facility. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I'm sure you guys have a mix of dock load and grade load stuff. But the the, the contractors listening here do HVAC or maybe roofing. So you've got you know membrane roofing on all of the facilities there at the location, and and yeah. You know, they listen to this show because this show is about the business of being a contractor. Mm -hmm. And it's, I love to get inside the mind of you because mm -hmm. we don't often get a chance to do that. So I, I want to ask you some of these things, but I was, by the way, I was looking through your background. You kind of glossed over it, but you've got a lot of lean manufacturing in it. Lots of lean yeah. when you're in the engine assembly and uh, back in Detroit and like mm -hmm. axle assembly, axle you're assembly. still doing. Yeah. Like why? Now why I do a truck assembly. <laughs> and truck assembly. Yeah. It just goes on. Yeah. The, um, just really quickly, I hear this a lot about lean and there's people already rolling their eyes. They're like, hey, look, everything we do is custom work. We don't need lean manufacturing. It's not going to work. This isn't an ad for lean manufacturing in general, but why do you as a leader believe in lean for a company? I mean, lean is a, is a terminology, right? But at the same time, when you're running any type of operation, being efficient is integrally important and not just being efficient in one way, right? Just building, you can make a lot of the widgets, but if the widgets don't have the quality, if the, the widgets have extra costs, if the widgets right, make people unsafe, mm -hmm. right, that can be damaging to the reputation of the product. And also it can introduce just a lot of things that are detracting from the success that you want to have. So lean is almost to me, it's kind of like how I run my life <laughs> because it's, I, I hear that it's repeatability, people, but... it's standardization, it's predictability, predictability it's at least yeah. knowing what good looks like so that you can identify quickly if you're off track and you can figure out where you need to go to, to get the wheels back on yeah. the road. So now let me do this. I'm now, you know, I said, I like to get inside people's minds, right? Uh oh, no, no, no. We're going to go. We're going to talk to the audience now. How many people in the audience are chuckling to themselves? They're like, yeah, we've got opportunities to definitely work better in the field. And I, I like to remind people lean and lean thinking also applies to the office to I'll call yes. it paperwork, even though I know it's 2024, you know, the word paperwork is declining, but, but lean applies to how we run business operations as well. Absolutely. I'm, yeah. I mean, when you come to having to make decisions quickly and in this world now, do you have to make decisions faster and faster, identifying those bottlenecks and your ability to make quick decisions um, can be the difference between you being able to put in a bid today and you being able to put in a bid tomorrow. Well, that what a good segue. That was a very nice segue. <laughs> Who, if I was putting in a bid to a large company such as yourself, because now everybody's ears are perking up, because who doesn't want to do a roof repair or a roof install or an HVAC or these roll-up doors? Mm -hmm. Actually, let me let me go. Back. I'll ask you this question: What kind of trade contractors do you typically bring in when we talk about facilities management at Daimler? Uh, you're talking about HVAC. I mean, that's easy. Okay, yeah, roof repair, yeah. asphalt repair concrete laying depending on weight requirements and mm. and and things like that um we have environmental so we bring in compactors and sorters and you have cleaning companies i mean the All gambit yeah. yeah absolutely so if you could build so this is the perfect setup Joanna. 
if you could build the perfect vendor partner, like a new, let's use the roll up door. I don't know why we're on roll up doors, but let's just use roll up doors. It's a trade contractor, right? They install them, they service them. I love service business. Mm -hmm. But if you could build the perfect vendor relationship with a roll up door trade company, what would that perfect relationship look like? You could build it from scratch the way you want. Oh, from scratch. That's a that's a great question. Where do I start with the answer? I would say, I mean, a good partner starts with building a relationship. Uh, being having someone that can come in and listen to what the challenges are, um, look for opportunities to to close that gap, but also the opportunities to offer an, a different perspective or a means to maybe improve upon what we have to call them in for so we don't have to keep calling again, right? right? You know, yeah. Not so just to keep for- coming back, making the same money, but how, hey, can you help me save some money? Yeah, finding opportunities. Absolutely. I, I liked, it's interesting that you opened by saying listening. Do you ever have any trade contractors who come in and all they do is talk? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. But they don't ask you what you want. Well, I'm in the unique position where I don't have, I, I am not the first person that they talk to. Sure. Right. Um, we have maintenance managers and facility managers, facility engineers that usually work through these companies that um, that work with the companies directly that give us an opportunity to to leverage what we need with the skill that they have. And mm-hmm. many of them, um, they rely on partnerships that either they have gleaned from the past because they have a lot of experience, those yeah. that they have gotten from trusted colleagues or business partners that say, hey, I have this problem. Do you know someone? So when I say to start with listening, it's also to um, put oneself in the position to build the relationships and find out where the needs are or and even put out what do you do and how you can help yeah. that you have the opportunity to be the recommendation on the other side of that call to say, Hey, I think that I can fill a need. Yeah. And work for that. Right. And work for that. Absolutely. Yeah, work for that. Make sure you earn the right to do that. It's so interesting that we're talking about, you know, in this case, how big companies buy, and it still comes down to that tiny little sentence. I got a guy. I, 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 I got somebody. I know, I know these people, they do that. And it's, there's so much value in that for all of us. It doesn't matter what size of the company it is, a mega global corp like yours or something smaller, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm traveling to um, Atlanta in a couple of months to see my sister and we're going to an event. And I, I text a friend of mine last night, like, I'm coming to Atlanta. I need a makeup artist. I know this is a tool show, but, you know, I no, wear makeup. Right. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it was easy. Hey, I know someone that I trust in Atlanta that also has the same style or the same expectations or the same quality of service. And I reached out to her before I go to Google or go to Instagram or Facebook and in the internet to try to see, can I get a head start on a good business partner that I can consider for my service? Yeah. It's because we're, we're, we're all the same at the end of the day. We want good referrals from good people. I, uh, I introduced you to a friend slash business friend of mine who's in women in HVAC and you're a board yeah. member of women in manufacturing, right? Which is, I think where you do a lot of your speaking from, right? Women in manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. So Absolutely. By the, we have lots of different board attend uh, board members from other industry associations listening here. So if you need a good speaker, I know some. Women in manufacturing is always looking for good speakers. <laughs> yeah, but they might be looking for you as a speaker too. <laughs> here. Yeah, here. Um, so I know you're not face-to-face with the facilities uh, right now, but this is where you came up from. You were in purchasing and and, and you worked your way through all of these different divisions and operations and you're you're still overseeing the whole facility. What are three, let's, let's say let three things that you worry about with a new vendor, like somebody who you've never worked with, they've never worked with you before. What are three things that maybe you guys are having a planning meeting? You're like, Hey, we got to watch out for this, this, and that. What are those things? Uh, the first one, and I actually put some thought into this since the last time we, we discussed, and I would say first and foremost, it's safety. Mm -hmm. Uh, Contractor safety is probably one of the biggest gaps, uh, where, when you have new contractors coming in, Right. To make sure that there are not injuries or fatalities or things that are unforeseen. Mm. So having a partner that has a strong conviction to safety is super important. 
because oh. that means that they're also going to ensure that they're bringing up and being a partner in making sure that their workers are safe while they're on the property. Because usually when some work is done, depending on the location, right, it, at the same time, operations could be going. And that introduces a different level of yeah. um, awareness and in just having your head on a swivel and precautions and things that need to be in place. So first and foremost, leading with the uh, conviction to safety and and what you need in order to make sure that the job can be done safely is is super important. Um the second thing I would say is project management. Mm. As a large facility um especially de depending on the scale and the scope of the project there are very limited windows to complete work when it mm. goes over the course of days. Um and I've had situations where um, even here, I don't necessarily talk directly as the first person, but when it comes down to the detailed planning and can you do it, can you not do it, do you pay yeah. for it? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm of course always involved, and in that, in those discussions or in that planning and in that analysis of the vendor to choose, right? Has this company demonstrated the ability to get the work done on time? Have they been demonstrated as a key yeah. word, right? That means that there has been business. There's something that can be brought to the table that is a little bit more synonymous with the type of work that we're asking for, because there may only be a three day, 36 hour window before we need to resume operations. Or if it's a little bit of a larger project, it right. may only be through a shutdown week, right? You're talking about time windows that are very fixed uh, and, needing to trust that the partner has a demonstrated ability to deliver on time so yeah. that we could resume operations is very, very important. Yeah. I would imagine that even the discussion of halting operations at a large facility like yours is a, you know, that is a, uh, a very, very serious multi, it just has so many implications, an incredible amount yeah. of implications, right? Absolutely. I mean, it costs money. Every truck costs money. And so for for every available opportunity that we don't build a truck is, you know, a, a lost sale and a lost customer that doesn't get their truck on time um, and a lost ability to keep the world moving. Like yeah. the trucks that we build, the they trucks and buses move a lot of different things, right? Yeah. Transportation is super important. What's the, is there a vehicle that you guys produce more in Mount Holly than another? Like, do you do buses or do you do uh, trucks or do you, are you doing the Western Star line? What's your line? Uh, we do medium duty Freightliner trucks. Mm, so okay. um, if you pay attention to some of the car haulers or sweet street sweepers um, that are going down the road, and if it's a Freightliner, it might even be an SD. So it has like the huge grill uh, yeah, in the front yeah, yeah, of it. Yeah. Um, those are the trucks that we built here in Mount Holly. Yeah. The majority of our trucks go to upfitters and they get fit into to cement mixers and off-highway construction vehicles, um, things that enable workers to do work, build infrastructure, right? Yeah. Move Big, product, fix likes, stuff. right? Fix likes. You know, you see um, Altec is one of our major customers and, you, you know, you see those trucks when light yeah. poles go down, right? And the big bodies go up. So it's really, really cool to see what our chassis are turned into. Yeah. You get to see your stuff on the news. You're like, oh, they're fixing the lights after that storm. And it, there's your truck rolling into the, into the frame. Yeah. It, it's cool. Or just driving um, home. There are, there's car haulers that even go by like the main red light that I have to turn at the same time every day. So it's really cool. Every time I see a, a Freightliner truck. Yeah. So, so such a small world. My dad was not a business person. He was a tradesman and he was a journeyman mm -hmm. fabricator. But what he did is they took truck chassis and they built on, you know, custom reefer boxes or they made flatbeds or flatback yep. trailers, all of that. And that's on the trailer side, but that's what he did. He, he would take your product and add whatever the custom configuration was for their end customer. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so cool to see it. And the companies that do that work are, are really awesome um, because, you know, we have customer experience week sometimes and then we bring the fully body product in and cranes. I mean, I'm yeah. always amazed and I get to see trucks being built every day and I, I never get tired of like seeing the whole thing come together. Yeah, that's so cool.
I took, I derailed you by the way. So the, the three you things, did. number one is safety. Number one is project management and just the, the number two is project ability. management. Pardon, pardon me. Said number one twice. Number two is project management. Oh, didn't I say safety? Safety and then project. You said management. safety was number one, and then you said number one again was oh. project management. <laughs> Attention to detail, Dominic Rubino needs improvement. Lean, <laughs> lean. Sorry. Well, uh, what would number three three be? Uh, I would say uh, number three is uh, the overall value package. And so, mm. you know, what I mean by that is the cost of doing one and two, because right, how efficient, how lean, how are you able to to do the work in the most um, cost advantage? Yeah, position. Cost and we, we absolutely. I mean, we we of course because we have to um, utilize the company's money and and view it as our own money right i've mm -hmm. always had that perception even back in purchasing you don't do anything with the company money that you wouldn't do with your own yeah so if i was at home and i want work done i don't just go with the, the one person that i get the referral i'll get two or three referrals and i will still look up and look at reviews and you want to especially for a large project you want to make sure you're getting um the most for also for the value yeah. for the cost yeah. That doesn't always mean that it needs to be um, super cheap and we shouldn't cut things out just to win the bid. And <laughs> because then that's like integrity and we probably won't come back yet because something's going to be missed. But right. Right, you're, the efficiency, right, the ability to take your operation and make it as lean as possible to find that ways that may cause your bid to be, mm. you know, more on the higher end than on the lower end, like those things um, really make a difference at the end of the day. Yeah. It's uh, you know, you've just summarized so many of the things, so many of the things we talk about on the show, you know, there's, we worry about go backs a lot as trade contractors, yeah. you know, going back Absolutely. punch lists or going back to fix something unnecessarily. And we think of that here on our side as a cost. But what I've yeah. neglected to remind people is that it's actually your point number two as well. If we had to, if we're, if for one part or one bolt, we couldn't get this done, the whole factory grinds to a halt. That is no good. And, no, and now not. that's, that's, that's a negative mark. Right. And it's, you know, I've now not proving my ability to do that kind of work. And so we Absolutely. see it as our, our constraint, but from your side, that's a valuable skill and ability to have everything you need, get this job done on time as promised for the lowest cost for the lowest yeah. welcome to contracting right which is lean <laughs> nicely done you looped it right back uh, <laughs> yeah it's but it, you know i hear you might have heard this as well from people who are a little resistant to lean they're like well we're not sorting peanuts here you know that only works for and i i have to remember and there's a gentleman that works with us his name is rick patak he's a wonderful uh, mm -hmm. foreman he's a foreman's foreman if that makes sense, right? Like he's a, yeah. and he taught, he says, look, lean is not about the product. It's about the process. So how we, how we do like how we move uh, a new mm -hmm. customer request through our company has to be lean. How we get it to the floor or the field is, yeah. has to be lean and how the field does it has to be lean. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're agreeing. What I would say is to, you know, working with big companies is great. But having the uh, awareness to know where you are appropriately positioned is also good enough. Like, yes, safety, quality, project management, cost, but um, also scale. We don't want to do business with somebody where it's damaging to them, right? And it's damaging to their business or what they're able to do. Mm -hmm. So just because you maybe go for that first bid and you don't get it, price it appropriately, price it effectively. But, you know, you can always ask for feedback. Hey, where did I come up short? And take that feedback and look at your operation, look at what it is that you're doing and see, can I do this better? Can I do this different? Um, can I maybe remove some waste? Or right? do I need to maybe build up a little bit more of this to leverage to get a better cost for my suppliers? Because, you know, we're all in the business of buying something from someone else and right. scale is a is a really big thing. And oftentimes, you know, companies that have that demonstrated experience have also learned how to scale themselves in a way 
to um, maximize their ability to drive the cost. Yeah. Running it smart. Every, we all have to do it all along the chain. You don't Absolutely. want to be the one person who's not paying attention to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I would say, you know, if you, you know, you had that relationship, you started with listening, you got the opportunity to get an RFQ package, right? Put in a quote, but if you don't get it, don't give up, right? Yeah. Ask, where did I fall short? Ask, you know, what was my gap? And, you know, purchasing agents, because everything has a buyer, right? Purchasing agents, yeah. they're good negotiators and they'll, they'll, they'll stretch it. And you have to know where your no is, but that doesn't mean that the, the relationship has to sour. And that, that doesn't mean that now, since you've had these conversations, engagements and interactions, you can mm -hmm. always ask, keep me in mind, right? For the next RFQ, keep me on the list of potential suppliers, especially yeah. since you've gone through, you've been vetted and validated. Yeah, even and, if you didn't win, and they, they know, know who you are. Yeah, absolutely, because then you know, at some given point in time, you might find the right fit, the right need uh, for what what you have to offer, where you would be the the best for that yeah. particular job. I, it, you've, you, you, this is the opportunity for me to remind everybody. That you know, here we are talking to business owners about business improvement. It, I, I wonder if anybody's surprised that there are entire podcasts just for purchasing managers and negotiators on being better at what they do. And so, yeah. if, if I walk into that unprepared for not knowing what my uh, riverbanks are, my yeah. what's you know where I'm able to go high and low, or for these different terms, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble because I'm going up against yeah. somebody who's taking their position very seriously, just like anybody Absolutely. listening here is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, business are about re relationship, but business is still business at the end of the day. It's not personal. Yeah. It is trying to see what the best value that the business can get and the, the best you could sell it for. And if those things line up, it's a win. If not, then try again next time. But you always have to be willing to try again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's start. I'm going to change gears a little bit because we're going to start to okay. work our way towards the end. I want to actually talk about your growth as a leader. Because okay. everybody here, I know she's like, that wasn't on the original script. <laughs> but I sense that you could carry this weight. You're fine. The I just want to know about some leadership. Like uh, the best word I can think of is a rebirth. Like you went into a situation thinking you knew X, Y, and Z, and you were and you found out, uh oh, I've got to change my thinking. Did you ever encounter that that place when you had like your a really great leap in your leadership skill or ability and what that was and how you got through it? Oh man. Um did you think this was going to be just a candy floss? Sorry. Cuz I joked I did and then now I'm trying to think of an example that doesn't break one of your rules. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just so everybody knows I'm going to buy you time here Joanna. Wait, the the <laughs> rules are you can't swear, can't cuss, curse or swear, right? There's no selling, which is easy. And then we don't speak negatively. Oh, that's the one. You can't speak negatively about somebody. No, it it's Acme actually Corp or Wiley e. Coyote or something. Oh, no, no, no. It's not even about a business. It was more the one about swearing because oh. most of my um, most of my leadership lessons have definitely come from manufacturing. <laughs> and in this business, we uh, we tend to keep it real. But I would mm. say that um, I play sports growing up. So I've always kind of worked myself or find myself in some type of situation to be a official or unofficial leader. Oh, yeah. Um, and so over the course of my career, as I've grown, I've actually started to tap more back into kind of the what makes me who I am. And one of the things that I've learned about mm. leadership is from level to level to level, self-leadership pre precedes any other type of leadership, whether it be a team or a business or an office. And so as I continue to grow as a person and, and maybe shed those things that were, as you grow up, like what you should do to what I actually want to do. And you only learn those things through experience yeah. and mistakes and gaffes, right? I, I learned how to lead myself first, more effectively it with any challenge that I may face. Wow. I got to tell you, that was goose bumpy. I, I don't know if you saw that. I wrote that down. Self-leadership comes first. 
I yeah, I didn't make that up. Uh, I have to oh. give uh, Michael Hyatt, I think the <laughs> <laughs> the credit or um, building champions. They do a lot of our executive yeah. coaches, and, oh, and, and that's yeah. something that has resonated. And then over the course of time, right, it's become also part of like, yeah, that's my one of my fundamental beliefs is that self leadership does precede team leadership, and. Mm. Um, and what that means, though, is when challenges come up, I always have to check in. Yeah. Check in with myself. Check in with myself. You know, not to overshare, but we just had a problem at my company. And somebody had to get let go. So we mm. did that. But I can't blame him because I wasn't checking his work. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's easy to, Ooh. it's easy to say that he or she, I, I guess I should genericize it, didn't do X, Y, and Z, but ultimately it comes back to me. I didn't get X. I didn't get the precursor, like what came before done properly. Cause maybe that person was savable. Maybe they weren't, but maybe they were. And it, uh, that's on me. Well, now we get into philosophy. Um, so <laughs> I am of the philosophy that um, people fire themselves. However, mm. I do think that every situation gives us an opportunity to reflect on what we have, what we ha could have done differently. Mm. If there was something that we have done differently, but also, I also believe that when it comes to business, there's a, core set of fundamental values that can never be negotiated. Right. And yep. unfortunately, regardless of checks and balances, you know, we, it's really important for us when we're selecting talent, do, does that talent have the same core fundamental values to where at least that baseline won't be there. Then you have an opportunity maybe to check the work or reflect, mm -hmm. right? But the, the fundamental values can't be negotiable even if I feel like I could have done something more. Yeah. That's thank you for that. You gave me just a moment of grace a and a moment, I, a moment. And now <laughs> back to, back to me wagging my finger at myself, Be you know, and, and I learned this, uh, I've learned this many times, but I also relearned it from a gentleman who owns multiple franchises in the home trades business and uh, a new immigrant to the country completely reinvented himself from below mm -hmm. nothing. Like he came with nothing and he's completely reinvented himself inside his own generation. And uh, he just had a great way of summing it up. He goes, you've either hired the wrong people, which is on you, or you hired the right people and you trained them wrong. Yeah. And the That's third thing is though, we sometimes like to take ownership and responsibility when something goes wrong. And we also have to recognize that decisions are, are made because that person made the decision. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. It's on, the, you know, there's a, there's a bit of shared, mm -hmm. uh, shared here. Joanna, it's easy to, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just, you know, I'm cautious of your time because I know you've got oh. things pending. So I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off. I, I need more you. wisdom. Give me more, some more Joanna wisdom and then tell us how we can find you. Oh, that is so funny. Well, uh, we were, we were talking about like how to do, business with big co companies or how yeah. to buy big yeah. and just in that that leadership scope and to try to circle around and bring it all back together um one of the things that's also helpful as you are growing and trying to uh, do business big is make sure you have mentors trusted colleagues um even if they are competitors but who can you reach out to to make sure that you don't have a blind spot? Like we always try to like grind and do things yeah. on, our, on our own. Um, none of us has gotten to where we are by being the lone wolf, even if that's what we want to convince people that we are. But uh, join trade associations, right? Yeah. Make sure that you have colleagues that are in similar roles that you are when you're leading a business that you can talk about business. It doesn't matter if you do HVAC and they do roofing or, you know, it could be the, the tire store owner. It doesn't matter. You're still business owners. And what can you learn from, from different people who are where you are? And if you're not around the people that are also where you want to be, then you mm -hmm. need to make sure some of them 
or they're, <laughs> are around because that's what's going to stretch you and that's what's going to push you. And that's really what's going to open up the opportunities that you're looking for. Words of wisdom. That was very well summed up. And I, and I agree and with, especially with the trade association thing, I've noticed in, as I've been in this trade, that the most successful business owners, the most successful companies, I'm sorry, are active members of their trade association. It doesn't matter yeah, what the absolutely. trade association is, but they're active in it because they want, they, they're craving new ideas. They want to stay in the forefront. They want to know what's going on in the market and they don't have their head in the sand. Yeah. And it's cool. And it's fun to be around people that get it. Like, so you can yeah. have a much different conversation around people that, you know, get it. Even if you never talk about the widget or the tool or the job, they have the same lived experience that you do. And, mm -hmm. and, and that makes all the difference. Yeah. Joanna, thank you. If somebody wants to find you in this big, wide, crazy world, how the heck do we find you? Um, the best place is on LinkedIn, to be honest with you. And I am very slow to respond because that's <laughs> not where I spend all my time. <laughs> but that is where uh, you can find me. Mm. All right. And it's Joanna Cooper or is it? Uh, I think it's Joanna C. Cooper, isn't it? Yep. It's Joanna C. Cooper. Excellent. Well, thank you. Good luck on your travels to see family. You got family in Detroit. Then you said family in Atlanta. So you're going to be flying a little bit more. Driving to Atlanta. I'm only four hours away. Oh, I from guess Charlotte. yeah, you're pretty close to there, aren't you? Yeah. Yep. I have a parent and one of my sisters lives in Detroit. The other is in Atlanta. So I'm right there in the middle, able to go everywhere. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, enjoy the trip. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us and look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, 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 what did you learn from Joanna and what can you put in place in your business? Again, if you're a commercial contractor, you, there were some really interesting things there. Um, they're looking for safety. They're looking for your uh, demonstrated project management skills. You've done it before. We've talked about that a lot on the show. And then overall value package, which they call cost. And Joanna was very clear. It's not always the cheapest price that's going to win. It's the combination of things. But on top of that is the relationship. You might be, you just might be talking to um, a commercial account you're not going to do business with in years. You know, there's a saying for those of you out there who do bighorn sheep hunting, and uh, you've probably heard this before, but the first sheep that you kill, first bighorn sheep you kill is born the year you started hunting for them. Like it could take you 10 years to get your first bighorn, eight or 10 years to get your first one. So it's born the year you start trying. Maybe your first commercial account is born the year you start trying to get that commercial account. It might take you 10 years, but then once you do, you know, like I was saying in the intro, wow, you've got a really great commercial account. Can you imagine having a client list that included Daimler truck or whatever else is in your city? Maybe it's Amazon. Maybe it's, you know, there's just so many big companies out there, right? With great names. If somebody wants to come and buy your business one day, that has value. It has value. It's worth doing. It's worth doing right. And then the other thing I picked up from her, which is just fantastic, is it still comes down to relationships because the people that report to her and, and in the positions she's been in before, they call each other and they're like, hey, I've got this problem at the facility. Who do you got? Who can I talk to? Isn't that interesting that it still comes down to who do you know who? And I want to be that person. I want to be the solution on the other end of the line, or at least I want somebody to say, hmm. I've got somebody you could talk to. He's not the guy, but he's going to know the guy, right? Or he's going to know the gal. It doesn't matter, but you want to be that person. Anyways, uh, hey, I want to read you a testimonial. Thank you, Joanna, again, for being on the show. But hey, I want to read you a testimonial that came in on Trustpilot. Trustpilot's very interesting. You know, we've got uh, a score of 4.6 on there right now, 4.6 out of 5, which is super cool. Um, this is a, a testimonial that came in about myself and Lee and the coaching that we do. So kind of cool to hear other people's perspective. Working with Lee and Dom has been truly remarkable. As the founder and owner of my own company, I face my share of challenges as an entrepreneur and investor. What sex, what sets them apart is their practical approach. They challenge me to see my blind spots, providing candid and valuable feedback. Their extensive experience adds immense value to their advice, making it highly relevant and actionable. As a lifelong entrepreneur, I appreciate their no-nonsense attitude, which aligns perfectly with my goal of accelerating toward my life's visions and goals. In summary, my experience to date has been transformative. If you're looking for partners 
who can help you break through barriers and achieve your goals, I wholeheartedly recommend coaching with these guys. What a nice thing to say. So thank you, Zane, for that. I mean, you'll be able to see it if you log into Trustpilot. All of my coaching, all of the coaching on my team is done under 10X Built, uh, which is spelled the number 10X BLT. Um, and we we'll talk about the name later and how that name evolved. But uh, that's what you have to look it up under. Anyways, fantastic. Thank you very much. Hey, guys, I want to simplify and solve a common problem. And the, that common problem came up twice today. I'm not sure if you heard it. Joanna talked about something called blind spots, which was very interesting because Joanna and I have never talked about blind spots. And then Zane mentioned it in his uh, experience in working with us as his business coaches, blind spots. So that's twice today it came up. So I thought I would take that opportunity to remind you about a document that we've got called the blind spots document. Um, it's a self-assessment. Where are my blind spots? A construction business reality check. And look, again, I'm going to ask you again and again, I'm not going to stop asking, print it off, go to a coffee shop, put your headphones in, face the corner, drink your favorite coffee with your favorite pen or pencil, and just answer these questions for yourself. Just do work. I want you to work on the business, not in it. Now, if you're saying, Dom, I just can't take an hour away. Well, you can. Your business coach has just asked you to do that and is holding you accountable to do one hour this week. One hour. That's it. And yes, your phone's going to ring. And yes, people are going to wonder where you are. And yes, you've created a situation just like I have many times where I'm the most important person in the world. It's time to break that chain. Because thinking is the most important work we can do as business owners. We started in the trades, so we get paid from the neck down, right? We started with our ability to swing a hammer, turn a wrench, uh, load balance, an HVAC unit, whatever our trade is, right? But now, as a business owner, we have to get paid from the neck up. And part of that is doing these powerful business tools. This one's called the... Um, um, where are my blind spots assessment? It's a construction business reality check. All you're going to do on this, there's there are 20, I'm just scrolling through it now. There's 20 questions. On each question, you score yourself from one through five. That's it. So am I a one or am I a five? One, by the way, is you, you feel your company is weak. Five, you feel your company strong. Just randomly, let's go look at question 15. Here's question 15 from this blind spots assessment. All of my teams have uh, clearly identify, discuss, and solve key issues for the greater good in the long term. Does your company do that? It doesn't matter if you're a two-person company or a 200-person company. Uh, on your team, do all teams clearly identify, discuss, and solve? You guys might know it as IDS. Identify, discuss, and solve key issues for the greater good in the long term. So think about that right now. Where did your company fall on that? A one or a five? A one is definitely needs improvement. Five is we are the best. Dom, you should have me as a guest on the show I'll tell you guys how to do it. So wherever you score yourself, anyways, that's just question 15. There's 20 of them. Uh, if you want this, just send me a text. You guys know my cell phone number, right? Just text me there and say blind spots. That's it. That's the keyword. And then I know which one to shoot back. Um, the cell phone number is 315-903-7853 and just say blind spots. Now, as I say that, I also have to apologize. I've just found a broken system in our company. Some of you have been texting, requesting these documents, have not received a response back. Uh, uh, that's on me because we had a little bit of a staffing change here. I'm going to use that larger picture. Um, but right now we're going back and fixing that. So if you're still waiting to hear from me, feel free to retext me or we'll get, you know, I'm, I'm working my way through the list right now. And it's my heart drops because I always say, I'm not going to leave you hanging. And now I've left you hanging and I don't like that. So anyways, uh, I'm on it. So that's blind spots. If you want to get that assessment so you can do that test with you, your business partner, yourself, maybe your spouse, do it with your spouse, you know, uh, whoever else you need to talk to about this. All of these tools are made so that you can do the work yourself and then take the actions you want. Of course, if you want to talk to me afterwards, more than happy. I would love to be as a part of that conversation. Um, but anyways, get it from me. The number is 315-903-7853. Uh, let's wrap it up there. Folks, all of this is just a placeholder for the day that you and I can sit across the table and talk to each other like real humans. Right now, we've got the podcast or video on YouTube. Uh, but until we get a chance to sit across the table like real humans, this will have to do. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>